Well, thank you so much for having, having me. Um, it's a real pleasure. It's, uh, I was just saying to Martin, so I call an economic geography is here, what an amazing conference this is, and it's always such a great place to be here. I have to say an apology at the beginning. I'm, I'm full of cold. My sinuses are blocked, so if I can't hear you, or if I don't understand you, it's probably somewhere, because your question got somehow caught in my blocked sinuses, so I will, I will do my best, but sadly it's going round in the family. Okay. And I will also try to stay as close as possible to the microphone, though you will see I do tend to move quite a lot in my presentation, so I might not, I might not be as good about this as, as I was um, planning to do. So I'm going to talk about finance and financial instability from a post-Keynesian perspective. And I, um, I apologize to those who have been, anybody has been to the FMM Summer School in 2019? Yes, so you will have heard that talk. I'm glad it's just one hand. I might ask you some questions in between. Is that okay? Just to check whether you paid attention. Yeah, yeah. So I apologize to those who have already been, to that one person who has already seen that presentation, but I, I, it's okay. It's not, it's, it's not too many. Um, and I will talk on finance. And what I, what I want to do in this presentation is to basically give you a bit of an overview of the role finance and consequently financial instability and financial crisis plays in post-Keynesian economics. So rather than going into detail into any specific models, I wanted to give you a bit of an overview of the kind of work that is going on, the background of that work, and just to give you generally a bit of a, a sense of how important finance is for post-Keynesian economics. What I'm not going to talk so much about is money. Um, we generally or sometimes have a separate presentation on money and credit supply, horizontalist, structuralist, etc., etc. But I, it will come into the presentation through, through some of the theories I'm going to discuss, but I'm not going to focus on, on money that much. But we can, I'm very happy to, to, to answer questions or discuss any of the things uh, later on in the, in the question session. And I will try to stick to an hour, but... I've already lost seven minutes in my introduction, so I think it's gonna, it's, look, it's not looking very good, I have to say. I apologize for that. <laughs> but you know, anybody who takes my lectures knows that. Okay, so very briefly, the motivation. And maybe also just to say, I'm assuming a bit of knowledge of post Keynesian economics. It's always very difficult to, to, to pitch those talks. But if there's anything that isn't, you know, I hope I'm not boring you, but if anything is um, not clear, then again, please do just ask the questions afterwards. So briefly, the motivation of my talk, and I think I don't need to say that we're all, we're all, although I'm realizing with my current students, they're not children of the 2008 crisis anymore because they didn't even realize that I was going on at that time because they were seven and eight and were interested in Pokemons like my children today. But anyway, so we at least have a, still this kind of sense, you know, financial instability and financial crisis and how important it is and how, in a way, permeated the world or the, the capitalist system is with financial instability and how important it is to study. And when I talk about financial instability, um, I don't want just to talk about financial crisis, you know, full-fledged financial crisis as we've seen it in the global financial crisis, the subprime crisis of 2008, but also the inherent tendency to financial instability. So movements in asset prices, exchange rates, capital markets, stock prices, etc., etc. So it might not be that we're kind of seeing this kind of big systemic financial crisis which we've seen and there you're definitely probably too young for that, the, the emerging market crisis of the late 90s or even mid 90s or the global financial crisis, but even the kind of, in a way, the dominant role of financial markets and the financial instabilities these create, ranging from probably most recently the COVID shock, or for those of you in the, in, who live in the UK, the recent turmoils in the government bond market, which is maybe bringing down our Tory government, but we'll see about that. Yeah. So I've given you a few statistics about the importance of that. Quite an old paper, but I find it really still very useful, just how important financial instability and financial crises are, and also what important repercussions they have, because, of course, as post-Keynesians, we appreciate that they, these financial phenomena are directly linked with real phenomena, with output, employment, inequality, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So what I want to talk about is what post-Keynesian economics can contribute to explaining these recurrent bouts of financial instability uh, and what kind of theoretical tools we have to analyze them. And I think this is important, and I think both for, for, particularly for those, for you, who is going to, uh, you know, might be working with post-Keynesian economics, it's really to think about it as a tool and as conceptual frameworks, so on, dare me saying it, ontological ways of looking at the world 
and analyzing uh, current empirical phenomena. Um, just also very briefly as a kind of, you know, as a way of introduction, of course, neoclassical economics by design has certain difficulties explaining financial instability or the kind of endogenous fragility of financial, of, of the financialized capitalist, of financial capitalism, of financialist capitalist system. Because economies are largely driven by real underlying phenomena, real fundamentals, we have things, so we have assumptions like the classical dichotomy and money neutrality, where money and finance doesn't, it might do so intermittently, but doesn't like permanently or fundamentally influence what's going on in the real economy. And when financial instability is introduced into neoclassic economy, economics, it's either through financial frictions, in, for example, in the, in the financial accelerator model, i.e., you know, Ben Bernanke, who just got the, um, he got the, the Nobel Prize, or more recently in, in, in add-ons like sunspot models, and I would even argue in behavioral finance models, but uh, we, can, we can discuss about that if you, if you disagree with me. And so, you know, pointing to, to then kind of the agency in neoclassical economics, which of course then, you know, it's, it's based on rationality. And then in the kind of more market failure type of economics, imperfect information, so here then financial crisis can arise because of moral hazard or asymmetric information, a la uh, Stieglitz or Krugman. To behavioral finance, where we have some assumptions of irrationality, but I would, I would argue still having this kind of underlying assumption of a classical dichotomy, where financial phenomena might be temporarily disturbing, but don't really change the underlying fundamentals and are definitely not part and parcel of capitalism or the economic system. Now, what about Boss Keynes in economics? Just very, very briefly. So, Boss Keynes in economics, and Mark said it, um, pointed it out as one of the characteristics of Boss Keynes in economics. Really, Boss Keynes in economics sees the economy as a, monetary, as a money production or monetary production economy. So, money and finance is part and parcel of how the economy operates and is part and parcel of the reasons why the economy and the capitalist system tends to cycles and also inherent endogenous instability and financial crisis. So rather than add-ons, financial crisis and financial instability are part and parcel or elements of the capitalist systems. And the reason why that is, and I will talk about a lot about this in this, in this lecture, is that another tenant in post-Keynesian economics is the existence of fundamental uncertainty. So that means that agents cannot know and won't be able to know the underlying um, real fundamentals, if you want. So, so there is an, um, it's in the non-ergodicity. So this is my sinus is being blocked. The non-ergodicity of assumptions, so agents don't know the underlying real fundamentals. And what that means is that agents will form the expectations under fundamental uncertainty, which means that things like psychological phenomena, subjective phenomena, or what I call intersubjective phenomena, and I come back to that, become very important in driving financial markets, but also the real economy. So how people think, believe, interpret, but also how they interact with each other becomes a very determ important determinant of economic dynamics. And that then also means that we have no inherent tendency to equilibrium or stab stabilization, but we have this recurrent bounds of instability and financial crisis. The other thing, and I hope I get to that in my presentation, is I think the other thing, and again, Mark alluded to this in his presentation this morning, I think the other thing which we can take from post in economics, particularly from Minskian economics, where I probably sit, is the crucial importance of looking at of economic and financial uh, phenomena from a balance sheet's perspective. So to really think how are assets and liabilities linked and what kind of conditions and structures, particularly liability structures, so the financing of certain operations are setting up and are conditioning the operations of both economic and financial actors. And I've given a few key authors here, and I think you were, you know, and Mark talked about them this morning. So the critical, uh, the critical macrofinance literature um, initiated by Daniela Gabor, but also Perry Merling, I think is fundamentally related to this kind of balance sheets view or Minskian strand of post Keynesian economics. And this is where we see this kind of interdisciplinary overlaps emerging, which I think are very exciting and are very exciting areas of research. But maybe I just think that because that's why I'm researching. We're always, we're always biased in what we think is interesting. 
Okay, so what I want to do then in this lecture, and I, I, yeah, I want to first introduce you to, I want to, I have divided these lectures into, in a way, two big strands of financial theories or theories which highlight or show us the importance of finance in understanding capitalist dynamics. First, I want to talk about what I call the asset side of uh, financial instability. So I want to talk about theories which particularly look at the investment decisions, look at the expectations of financial investors and their decisions to kind of invest or not invest. And here I want to talk spe specifically and particularly about Keynes' general theory and particularly chapters 12 and 17. So these are the chapters where he talks about issues like animal spirits, fundamental uncertainty, conventions, which are these intersubjective processes I've talked about before. And also, um, and there again, I will come back to a bit what Mark said about this morning, liquidity preference theory. And um, theories or approaches which have picked up on liquidity preference theory and developed that both in the closed and the open economy. And then the second part I want to talk about is Minsky. I think we cannot talk about finance and financial instability without talking about Minsky, which I here broadly classify as the liability view of financial instability, because what Minsky really did is to bring in, as I've already said, this interlocking nature of balance sheets and the importance of funding and financing decisions to influence the asset decisions of actors, but also the emerging instability and financial crisis. And for both of these approaches, I want to give you very briefly what are the policy implications if we're adopting such a view. And I want to give you a bit of an, I want to give you some examples of, um, well, it's not necessarily current research, but some examples of the research that has been doing, that has or is being done in those traditions, just so that you can join the dots a bit in case you are reading around, in case you are doing a PhD and um, you're coming across some of these authors. Okay, then let me, are there any questions to that before I? No, okay. Then let me start with Keynes. And I'm sorry, this is a bit of a wordy slide, but the wordier the slide gets, the more insecure I am about the theory. This is, you know, this is a little secret to give away. <laughs> Don't tell my real students that, but the more words there are on the slide, the more I need to know and read about them. But um, so what Keynes, so Keynes is, so Keynes is concerned uh, I don't know what Keynes' concern was. Let me, this is, this is Crotty's reading, Crotty 1990. Keynes' concern was about finance, but it was particularly about investment. You know, in post Keynes economics, investment, firm investment stands at the core of the business cycle and of economic dynamics. And what Keynes wanted to show or wanted to analyze is the kind of the cyclicality and the instability of firm investment and hence uh, economic dynamics in a capitalist economy. And in so, in, in so doing, or by doing so, in a way, financial markets become part and parcel of his analysis on two grounds. And again, I cite it directly from Crotty, he calls it a star billing. So Keynes gave a star billing to finance on two levels. And, and finance, and also going back to this, you know, the fundamental uncertainty and the kind of the indeterminate nature which finance brings into real or investment decisions in this case. So the first way of how finance comes in for Keynes is through the cost of borrowed funds, i.e. the interest rate. Yeah? And I will talk about that later. Importantly here, for Keynes, the interest rate is not a determinate outcome of savings and investment decisions, so it's not a loanable fund theory. But for him, the interest rate is an outcome of fundamental uncertainty and agents need to protect themselves from fundamental uncertainty through holding money. So the interest rate is an outcome of agents' decisions to hold money or other assets. I.e., the interest rate is a direct outcome of um, financial monetary and financial market processes, which again are determined by I don't want to overstress fundamental uncertainty, but just the kind of the expectations in this monetary and financial markets and the determinate nature that comes with it. So this is the first way how finance comes in. The second way finance comes in <clears throat> is that Keynes argues investment is fundamentally determined by what he calls the marginal efficiency of capital. And that has nothing to do with the marginal efficiency of capital in neoclassical economics. Um, and I come back to what the marginal efficiency is, but he basically says um, that, so 
Invest firms will take an investment decision comparing the marginal efficiency of capital, which is fundamentally determined by the prospective yield, and I'll come back to that, and the interest rates as the cost decision. So if the marginal efficiency of an investment uh, decision or an investment project is higher than the cost of financing that investment project, i.e. the interest rates, then investment will take place. And importantly, both of these determinants, the interest rate and the prospective yield, i.e. the marginal efficiency, are determined by financial markets and expectations and decision-making in, uh, in, in financial markets, which means investment decisions are determined by them, which means investment decisions will be cyclical and will be, um, in a way, inherently unstable because they're driven by these financial market dynamics from both sides, through the interest rate and the marginal efficiency of capital. Okay. So then let's have a look a bit closer about what Keynes says about both of them. Let's have a look at the marginal efficiency of capital uh, first. So how does Keynes define the marginal efficiency of capital? So he says it's equal to the rate of discount, which would make the present value of the series of annuities given by the returns expected from the capital asset during its life just equal to a supply price, yeah? And the relation between the supply price of capital assets, so it's basically investments or the margin efficiency is the relationship between, relationship between the supply price of capital assets and its prospective yield. Now the supply price is given. This is the current cost of buying new equipment from the capital goods industry. That's a cost which is there. The prospective yield, however, is the expected return from that capital assets. That means for Keynes, and because it's expectations about uh, the return on these capital assets, there is no stable anchor. Yeah? So in, uh, firms who need to take investment decisions have no underlying anchor to their kind of return expectations. So these kind of expectations will be formed under fundamental uncertainty and partly determined by the confidence and the psychology of those who have to take these decisions. And this is where, who has read chapter 12 of the general theory? Oh, one hand, two, three, yeah. And this is really where um, Keynes' chapter 12 of the general theory sits in. Yeah, so when he talks, in chapter 12, he talks about the things like animal spirit and the beauty contest and the music that doesn't stop, you know, so even, even if it's basically, it talks about the stuff even the Financial Times writes about. Um, so when, when he talks about this kind of psychological processes or these kind of, um, not irrational, but kind of, you know, this, this uh, unstable behavior in financial markets. So the prospective yield, then he says, is the, is the considerations upon which expectations of prospective yields are based are partly existing facts which we assume to be known, more or less certain, and partly future events which can only be forecasted with more or less confidence. And then he goes on to say, we may sum up the state of, state of psychological expectations which covers the latter as being the state of long-term expectations. So for him, the prospective yield, i.e. the marginal efficiency of capital, i.e. the decision to invest, fundamentally de 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 depends on the state of long-term expectations. And these long-term expectations are determined under fundamental uncertainty. Yeah? And that means these long-term expectations will be driven by these psycholo I don't, I don't like the word psychology, but by these kind of subjective and intersubjective processes of price formation. So this is the, the, the animal spirit, the beauty contest, um, and this is where we're going a bit into behavioral finance, but we, but we can discuss this. Now, importantly, what Keynes then does is because this is a system which creates chaos, isn't it? I mean, if it's just kind of subjective expectations and if it's just basically what people make up, the question is, well, what does bring stability to financial markets? What does bring stability to the state of long-term expectations? What, brings, what, does, what, what explains that sometimes financial markets are actually, you know, relatively calm and we don't experience periods of financial turbulence? And he says then what brings stability to financial markets or, and, uh, in, um, and consequently investment decisions, decisions are conventions. And these are this, so these are intersubjective processes, so basically it's conventions, which is assuming that the existing state of affairs will continue indefinitely, expect, except insofar as we have specific reasons 
to expect a change. So there's a typo. It's except insofar as we have specific reasons to expect a change. So he says convention. So people basically assume the future to be like the past. So convention anchor the long-term expectations, which means there's some temporary stability in those expectations. In, in, in those expectations. However, those can change um, at any time when conventions break down. So it causes the precarious sense of conventions. And that also means that we have, you know, waves of optimism and pessimism. So if the market is positive and we have a, a, a positive growth story, you know, the conventions might lead to positive and optimistic long-term expectations. If they're negative stories, then it might be the opposite. So just to give you an example, um, I did my PhD research, and some of you might know that, on uh, foreign exchange markets. So I did a lot of interviews with foreign exchange traders, and I worked on a Brazilian real. Any Brazilians here? Ah, there are more Brazilians here than people have read the chapter 12 of the general theory. Can we just, uh, <laughs> can we just hold that on the records? <laughs> anyway, so the convention, so when I was, so I was doing that in August 2000, in August 2008, which mind you, what happened in September 2008? What happened in September 2008? Just shout out. Lehman Brothers, thank you very much. So that's when the global financial crisis started. Anyway, I did my interviews in, in, in August 2008. Of course, nobody predicted the global financial crisis, but everybody was very, very bullish on the Brazilian real, and the convention in the market was that because of China and because of China's increased demand for um, Brazilian commodities, i.e. soya, the Brazilian real would continue to appreciate over the medium to long term. Never mind what happened in, 2000, in September, the Brazilian real depreciated by 60% because Lehman Brothers nearly failed, yeah? So, but just to give you an idea of what these conventions then could be. And we have that. Now, importantly, other than speaking about conventions, it's also in, it's also in chapter 12 where Keynes explicitly brings in the financial markets and explicitly brings in um, what he calls speculation. Yeah. So he then says, so we have got this subjective financial markets, we have got conventions, and then we have got different actors in those financial markets. So we have different actors which have to form these long-term expectations. On the one hand, he says, we have got those people who really are the managers and who make the decisions based on the, on the yield, on the knowledge of the enterprise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then there are those pesky speculators because all they do is in a way they long form their long-term expectations on expected stock market returns on the secondary market, they speculate. And it's the interaction between the two of them which in a way determines uh, the state of long-term expectations, which, sorry to remind you again, in his view then really determines investment. So this is fundamental to determine, it's not just a kind of phenomenon located in the stock market or stock market capitalization, which doesn't have any repercussions on the real economy, but for him, this is a fundamental determinant of investment, among others. Yeah, so post Keynesian is a heterogeneous field, as Mark said this morning. Not everybody puts so much emphasis on financial factors. But if we wanted to emphasize it here very much, as is my role in this lecture, then this would be, this would be the outcome, yeah? And so, yeah, so I've given you another quote here. So he says, if I may be allowed to appropriate the term speculation for the activity of forecasting the psychology of the market, so he uses psychology here, and the term enterprise for the activity of forecasting the prospective yield of assets over the whole life, yeah? And then he has this, so, and then he sees, as I said, he sees this kind of, you know, the outcome of, of stock market prices and investments as the interaction between those who are the speculators, speculators and the enterprise. And then he has got this famous quote where he says, well, speculators, speculators may do no harm as bubbles on a steady stream of enterprise. But the position is serious when enterprise becomes a bubble on a whirlpool of speculation. When the capital development of a country becomes a byproduct of the activities of a casino, the job is likely to be ill done, yeah? So if speculators are become more dominant than enterprise, then we're really entering a phase of, se of severe financial instability and hence negative implications for investment. And interestingly, what he also says is that Keynes then goes on to argue, and he says actually for him, the more developed financial markets become and the more liquid financial markets become, the higher the risk of financial speculators um, becoming more dominant over the enterprise. 
Yeah, so rather than the neoclassical assumption that more liquidity in financial markets will actually stabilize them, for him, you know, the more liquid markets become, the more short-term or speculative investors there are, the more likely the um, the, out or the more likely the, the occurrence of financial instability and of financial fluctuations. Yeah. And so what are the outcomes then? I've already said that. So we have got then in this view then rather than kind of like a stable economy, we have swings in asset prices detached from fundamentals, which are inherent features of, of, of capitalist economies, and which means capital is unstable because investment is unstable and because equity markets are unstable. Yeah? So this is a very, very, you know, as Mark said this morning, strong opinions always get a most. But this is, a, in a way, this is an, not exaggerated, but this is strong formulations of Keynes's financial theory of investment. If we wanted to kind of state it in these stark terms, we could say that capitalism is unstable because investment is unstable because equity markets are unstable. Yeah, so this is a financial theory of unstable capitalism. Okay. Now, and what are the policy implications of that? Well, I think, you know, I think we, we um, and I think that probably where, where Keynesians would unite again is we, you know, we need to stabilize conventions. Uh, we need to try to kind of, um, you know, give some guidance to financial markets, although again, this is, you know, that we can just discuss and central banking is doing slightly different things at the moment. But, you know, what, what, what probably maybe a bit more uncontroversially from a post Keynesian perspective is just we have to force socially beneficial investment. So if capital, the private capital market isn't providing the investment we need, we have to do it through social means or even through state investment. So, you know, as we, as we, as we know as Keynesian, is that for Keynes, then there is the important role for public investment, state expenditure and state investment. Okay. So this is the first part. So this is how margin efficiency, the prospective yield, and chapter 12 of the general theory, um, which I do encourage you to read. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, it's easier to read than other things of Keynes. Um, can help us to, in a way, brings in finance as a, as a fundamental determinant of, of capitalist development. Now, the other way finance comes in, and another crucial workhorse for post Keynes in economics, particularly um, for those who work with monetary theory, is liquidity preference theory. And uh, what Keynes calls is generally, uh, or is kind of um, own rate of returns equations. Oh, sorry, I forgot the application. Sorry, I was running ahead of myself. So if you want to, so for, just to kind of, I said, I would for all of these series, I would give you some kind of applications. So some people have worked very much in this, what I would call kind of um, more, you know, fundamental uncertainty strand, psychology strand, um, subjective strand, is there's amazing work by Sheila Dow, who has written a lot about Paul Davidson, of course, as well. And for those of you who are interested in open economy issues, I would think that uh, John T. Harvey's seminal work on exchange rate determination probably fits in that kind of um, theorization of financial markets or financial phenomena, where he highlights a lot, you know, the importance of conventions and, and psychological phenomena, among other things. You know, he might correct me if he was here, but I think I would probably locate John's work in, in that strand of, an, of, uh, of post Keynesian theory. <clears throat> but of course, there are problems with it, yeah, or potential problems with it. First, you know, it, it just focuses on the investment decision. It doesn't consider the liability side of balance sheets yet, and you will see where I'm going, and this is really where Minsky comes in. The other thing is that actually, you might disagree with me, but it's, it, it, it's, in a way, it's a kind of like, it's, it's a neat theory of financial market behavior, and I think that's probably why New Keynesians and behavioral finance has picked this up, this kind of, you know, the, the, the Keynesian animal spirit, et cetera, et cetera. But it is fundamentally not a systemic theory of financial crisis. Yeah? So it doesn't kind of, in a way, it doesn't explain us why the capital system inherently tends to financial crisis and becomes like an endogenous feature, like in Minsky, uh, when we come back to that. And, and arguably, it kind of, you know, it has a very strong focus on psychological factors, but the, yeah, these psychological factors are very context and time specific. And, you know, criticism have been raised that at the end of the day, some of, you know, the question, you know, arises whether these theories can, can tell us anything about, you know, the capitalist system beyond these context-specific factors. Although my referee, too, in one of my papers strongly contested that, and I, I think it's a point. Yeah? 
So that's so that's that's the kind of the the the, the chapter 12 and the, the the speculation. Now the second, as I've already introduced, I was running ahead of myself is liquidity preference theory, and that's really um, fundamentally Keynes's theory of money, the interest rate, and then in extensions also a general theory of asset prices and of asset demand. Yeah. So. As I've said before, in a way, for Keynes, and you know, this could be a lecture in itself, so I apologize for having to go quite, quite quickly about this, but for, for Keynes, you know, another outcome of fundamental uncertainty is the need for agents to protect themselves against those fundamental uncertainty. And the way they do that, and I think Paul Davidson's work is really, really important here, the way they do it is through demanding money. Because money is the secure abode of purchasing power a long time and the means to settle obligations, both payment obligations and financial obligations. So it's money which helps us to protect against the fundamental uncertainty in the economy. And the interest rate is the reward that has to be offered so that agents depart from the security of money, yeah? And liquidity preference then is the state of, if you want to, so expectations or the current state of uncertainty, which either, you know, which, which in a way requires or kind of makes agents demand for money. So if liquidity preference is high, if people are uncertain, if people want to protect themselves against uncertainty, the demand for money will rise and so will the interest rates. If liquidity preference is low, if people are positive, are optimistic about the future, then the demand for money will, will fall. People are prepared to input their liquid resources into other assets, maybe it's financial assets or property or chairs, um, but they're, they're prepared to depart with money and the interest rate will fall. Yeah? So money in this system has what we call the highest liquidity premium. Money can secure and save us against the in a way, the passing of time, it protects us against what we call the passing of historical time rather than logical time as in neoclassical economics. Now, I can't go into, as I said, I'm, I can't go into money theory. And in a way, I don't know, again, people might disagree with me, but in a way, money, you know, the, the money theory in itself is, in, in a sense, the way what is money is not that distinct in Keynes than in, in, in other theories. So money, you know, money has several functions. It's a unit of account, it's a store of value, it's a means of payments, and there are four motives to hold money, the transaction motive, the finance motive, the precautionary motive, and the speculative motive. These different functions of money and different motives of holding money have been used differently by different authors and, you know, and, and post-Keynesian authors. But I said, in a, in a way, they're not that fundamentally different from, from, um, from Marxist economics or, or neoclassic economics. The emphasis might differ, yeah, but the, the, the functions of money per se are not that different. What I do want to talk about, though, is that, so this is basically, so this is liquidity preference theory. And liquidity preference theory, in principle, or the way Tobin has interpre interpreted this, was basically a decision between money and bonds. So do agents want to hold money to, set, to, to protect themselves against uncertainty, or are they investing into financial assets? Now, people building onto liquidity preference theory have actually argued or have taken liquidity preference theory as a general theory of asset prices. So rather than just looking at money and bonds, um, authors like Craigel, Cavalli, Ray, and Minsky, so in a way, kind of some of those people are now reappearing in MMT, which um, Mark talked about this morning, they have actually inter interpreted liquidity preference theory as a general theory of asset prices where every asset and the draw, sorry, and the draw on Keynes's own rate of return equation, chapter 17, where he argues that every asset has or has, has its own rate of return, which is constituted by four factors. The first one is Q, the expected return. And again, you can see where you see where the expectations under fundamental uncertainty come in. The second one is the carrying cost. So how much does it how much how costly is it to store that asset? which of course for money is nil, um, for a chair might be a bit more. A is the expected appreciation of that asset against 
the unit, the unitaire, which is money, and L is the liquidity premium. <laughs> and so every asset has um, four, these four returns. Well, of course, money has only what? The liquidity premium, thank you very much, yeah? Now, some people quite like to write this, you know, an own rate of returns of an asset equals the liquidity of premium of money, and then so we compare the return of those assets against the liquidity premium of money and make, in a way, a kind of a portfolio decision which I think is correct, but I, I prefer using this own rate of return equation as, in a way, a heuristic device to show what features are, or in a way, what constitutes the return of an asset based on liquidity preference theory, rather than implying some equilibrating tendencies by an equal sign. Yeah? So, basic sort of, so maybe just to give you back a bit where we are, where we, where we are in the general argument of the, of the lecture. So, I've started with saying that, in a way, there are two fundamental factors or two ways finance comes into Keynes' investment theory. The first one was the marginal efficiency of capital, the prospective yield, and I've talked about chapter 12. And the second one was the interest rate, which is fundamentally determined by liquidity preference theory, where the interest rate is an outcome of agents' attempt to protect themselves against fundamental uncertainty, which arises from the passing of time. And the, in a way, portfolio decision between holding money, which only has a liquidity premium, and holding financial assets, which also offer other returns in the case of financial assets, an interest rate or, or an equity return. Yeah? And the interest rate is the outcome of that portfolio decision on the fundamental uncertainty whether to hold money or whether to hold a financial asset. And the higher the liquidity preference, the higher the demand for money, and the higher the interest rate. And then I went on to say that some authors have used liquidity preference, which in theory, which in principle was this kind of distinction between money and bonds, have also developed it as a general theory of asset prices. Now, how has, how has this been applied? So how, where do we kind of, in a way, see this application of liquidity preference theory in ongoing post-Keynesian research or literature? Again, you will see, you know, I've, I've tried to find female authors, <laughs> and uh, so... To, you know, to see, to also highlight, you know, um, female contributions. But one, I think one really crucial work is the work by Sheila Dow and Victoria Chick, uh, which apply liquidity preference theory, particularly that of banks, in order to apply, in order to analyze credit supply, but also in order to analyze regional monetary and financial dynamics, so regional kind of uh, agglomeration and, or financial instability across regions. Yeah, so they use uh, to, um, in a way, in a very structuralist um, tradition, they use liquidity preference to alter or to argue that changes in liquidity preference alter the allocation to assets with different degrees of liquidity. Yeah, and they argue that um, assets located in the peripheries have a lower liquidity premium, which means allocation to those assets will alter as liquidity preference varies. And as liquidity preference increases, the demand for those assets with a lower liquidity premium will decline, which means we see a contraction in credit supply to peripheral regions in moments of increased uncertainty, i.e. increased liquidity preference. Yeah? And they also use it to show how sudden increases in liquidity preference, so sudden increases in, in risk and uncertainty, can lead to financial instability through the operations of banks and the credit supply of banks. Yeah? The second way liquidity preference theory has been applied, and Mark has alluded to this, and this is where I think my own work, work fits in, um, is the currency hierarchy framework. So it has been mentioned this morning, and what the currency hierarchy framework has basically done is to um, <clears throat> apply liquidity preference theory, and particularly Keynes's uh, own rate of return, so the chapter 17, which I've just showed you, to the open economy to argue that actually in the open economy, the money of the system, or there's a, in a way there's a hierarchy between monies, and only one money can fulfill money, you know, kind of the money function as in the closed economy. And so we have a hierarchical international monetary system where the money with the highest liquidity premium globally sits on the top, which of course is currently the US dollar. And all other monies or currency are assessed against that top currency relative or based on their kind of um, 
own rates of return based on chapter 17. So what that literature then does, I mean, this is just a very cursory overview, is by applying liquidity preference theory to the open economy is to show how we can explain phenomena like external vulnerability, foreign exchange accumulation, but also things like original sin, so the inability of many developing and emerging countries to borrow in domestic currency, can be explained through a liquidity preference theory framework which shows that not all monies are equal in a hierarchic and globally structured monetary economy where the dollar sits dominantly on the top and other currencies sit below. Yeah? Right, so this, this is the kind of, in a way, this is the, the application of the second strand. Oh, our hippies here. <laughs> Hi, Marco. Marco Passarella, an ex-colleague at, um, ex at Leeds, and now Foskins in hippie. So we... <laughs> Sorry, Marco, but I know you can take it. So, <laughs> and it's, in a way, it's a good interruption. I could see, you know, there's a point... In the, sorry, I can't... There's a point... Good uh, moment of interrupting that <laughs> and, giving, and giving people a break of having to listen to post in monetary and financial theory and my blocked up, my blocked up voice. Okay. Right, but let me take, I wanted to take a break here anyway because I know it's a lot to take in. Are there any questions here at this point before I go to Minsky? Anything which didn't make sense? Anything fundamental? Or any, not fundamental. Anything you wanted me to kind of elaborate a bit more on about? I thought I'd make a little break here rather than droning on for 60 minutes. Yes, there's a hand, yeah. Oh, we have, oh, oh, I, ha I have an order. There's a microphone, um, because we're recording this session, uh, so we have a microphone, so, so students are, yeah, um, are expected to. But make it please specific to, to what I've said, so we can have a general discussion at the end. Um, anyway, you can have, yeah, sorry if I have taken the wind out of your question now, but I... Uh, <laughs> In case it's not too specific, just uh, skip it. I wondered how the liquidity preference theory and how interest rates are determined there can be reconciled with how central banks set interest rates um, today. Yeah, so that's, a, I think I, I will give a very, so there is, um, there's a long and a short answer that, give, let me give the theoretical answer and I'll give the empirical one later and I, I'll pick it up in it. So I think one thing that liquidity preference theory applies and that's why it has been criticized a lot is in a way it, 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 it assumes a vertical money supply. Yeah, so it assumes that in a way the interest rate is only determined by money demand rather than money supply, which of course in a way is inconsistent with endogenous money theory, where we say, you know, and not, you know, money supply is endogenous to the to the economic system, which I think is what your question kind of hinted at, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, okay. So that was yes, yes, um, absolutely well picked up. And this is this is one of the this is one of the inconsistencies people have raised in Keynes's theory. Yeah. Any other specific questions? And I'll scare you now, haven't I? to ask questions. Okay. Right. Let me go to Minsky then. Let's go. Oh, do you have a... I saw another question. Yes. Don't ask me about production functions. <laughs> I don't know anything about those. <laughs> um, can you say more about what actually determines the hierarchy of money uh, or currencies? Oh, I would love to do that. Can I do that at the end? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, I, I can go on about currency hierarchy. <laughs> But I, I, will, I will do that at the end. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's continue to min with Minsky. I wanted to give you a bit of a break. Right, so, now what about Minsky? So, uh, now, and I, I've, I've kind of, in a way, I've already introduced him. So, and it's also the way I structured the lecture. So, on the one hand, we have this, you know, more, more Keynesian, uh, if you want, so asset side views of the world, which really look at the investment decision, um, you know, why do people hold money? Why do people hold other assets? Why do they, you know, how do they, you know, how do they form the expectations, how important expectations, etc., etc. So that, that is in a way, that's, that's Keynes. But what, what Minsky really did or said is that, you know, you cannot analyze uh, economic and financial behavior without also looking at the liability side of balance sheets. 
So what he really needs breaks in, it's the kind of the funding and the financing decisions of economic and financial operations, and importantly, the permanent payment commitments which are set up by these financing and funding conditions, i.e. debt, which need to be honored over time and which create certain structural conditions and condition the operations of economic financial agents. And so what he has, and again I've alluded to that, what we, we, we really brings in, and I think this is extremely valuable, and I think this is why I've said this, you know, sometimes Poskin economics is, is a tool as much as a theory. He really brings in a kind of a balance sheet view, a Wall Street view of, of capitalist economies, where we need to look at the interlocking balance sheets of assets and liabilities, and where all entities can be treated uh, as, you know, as like banks acquiring assets by issuing liabilities, or where, where, all, treat, where all agents are treated as balance sheets entities. And I think the person who probably, in a way, did, you know, does that or, or you, know, you know, brings it home, I think, I think most effectively is, is, is definitely Perry Merling's, Perry Merling's uh, work. And, and I'm halfway through his new book, and it's, it's, it's very interesting, and, it's, and, and I really appreciate his work. I sometimes find it a bit sad that Perry doesn't engage more with the other part of post and you know, he seems to kind of have his own and world, if anybody knows him better, can explain to me why, but uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really very important contribution, and I include him into the post keynesian economics. So what Hyman Minsky, and that's and, uh, two things I want to talk about if I have time, is you know, basically Hyman has a, a financial theory of investment, so that is similar to, um, to Keynes's work, and then of course he has this famous financial instability uh, hypothesis, the theory of an in inherent and endogenous fragility of capitalist economies. I'm going to go through both of them relatively quickly now because I'm running out of time and I'm also don't, not sure how much of you have done this already, but I'm happy to go, you know, to go into more detail in the, in the question and answer session because I know some of you might actually have done the financial instability hypothesis quite a lot. But I will, <clears throat> I will go through them without going into too much detail and then we can pick some of, some, some of the things up which I might have missed in the question and answer answer session. So let's have first a look at Minsky's financial theory of investment and you can see this is a slide full of words which indicates it's not something I'm that familiar with and I had to, I had to read up but I wanted to introduce you to it anyway because I think it's a very important workhorse and you will see that some of the things actually come back in his financial instability hypothesis. So basically what this kind of meant, and, and I'm, I'm, um, this presentation, also this, the, the way I'm presenting is, is based on a, on a paper by Ray and Tamoin. It's in the references list. So please do read that paper if anything is, is unclear or blame them if anything is wrong. So basically what, what they argue is that Minsky's financial theory of investment has got two building blocks. It's got the two price system and the lenders and borrowers risk, um, which is, you know, the, which is more common in post Keynesian economics anyway. So what he argues then is he says investment demand, so we're coming back to investment as this kind of you know, fundamental determinant of capitalist um, uh, economies, is a function of the difference between the supply price, which is the replacement cost of new capital assets, and the demand price. It's the price that investors are prepared to pay for acquiring capital assets. So that in that sense is nothing too revolutionary. But what he then says is that actually the supply price is the price for current output, the supply price of capital, cost plus markup, plus what he calls the lender's risk. So it's plus the cost for, so the cost of finance to supply, you know, to, to, um, to buy that, to, to, or in a way to provide uh, that, um, that output. Where the lender's risk is the risk which the banks are taking on to lend to the capitalist firm. Yeah? And what he argues then is that lender's risk is not stable. Yeah? So he argues that as debt increases, as bank lending to the capitalist firm increases, the lender's risk increases because there's rising leverage and there's rising risk to the lending bank, which means that the supply price also increases as, the, in a way, the investment process and particularly the debt issuing process or the credit giving process of the bank um, goes on in time. So that's the supply price. On the other side, we have the demand price, which is the expected stream of income. Remember Keynes, you know, so how much am I expected to earn of an asset plus, 
and this is again important, plus the subjective, the subjective borrower's risks. So the borrower's risk is the amount of leverage, i.e. debt, the borrower, so me, if I'm getting a credit from the bank to buy myself a house, which is collapsing in value in the UK at the moment, is prepared to take on, um, yeah, is prepared to take on, full stop. And again, similar to the lender's risk, the borrower's risk, of course, also increases with time as I leverage on, on what I have in my house. Importantly, though, what he says is that the borrower's risk is subjective. So it depends on the current assessment or the convention. And then, you know, we're coming back to chapter 12 and you can see how this is linked. It's coming back to the kind of the optimistic or the, the optimism or the pessimism in the market and how... Um, agent assess the borrower's risk or uh, stroke the margin of safety. So when we talk about Keynes, we often also talk about the margin of safety. So how much cash do I want to have um, I'm under my pillow or in order to be able to, my, to, in order to be able to pay my debt if conditions might worsen? Yeah? So how much leverage am I prepared to take? That's the borrower's risk or the margin uh, of safety. Yeah? I'm not going to go into this balance sheet interpretation of chapter 17. And yeah, so as I've, yeah, I've, I've said, it, so the lenders and the borrowers increase now with the overall debt level in Kalensky's principle of increasing risk and, you know, depend on this convention and the kind of the optimism or pessimism in the market. And so what they then show then, sorry, so investments, the quantity of investment goods purchased takes place as long as the demand price adjusted for borrower's risk is above the supply price. So as long as the demand price, so as long as my expected return adjusted by the borrower's risk is above the cost of investing adjusted by the lender's risk, so the banks, the banks prepare the willingness to give me financing for my project, investment will take place. Yeah? So in a very simple, in a, in a very simple diagram, as long as the demand price um, PID is above the supply price. Ah, I've got a little pointer here. Yes. So as long as the demand price is above the supply price, investment activity will take place. Yeah? But you can also see here, as I've already said, as the investment process goes on, as the debt level increases, as the leverage increases, both in a way the supply price, the, in a way the supply price increases because the banks are, the lender's risk increases. Yeah? and the borrower's risk. So yeah, exactly, and the borrower's risk increases so the demand price, um, the, the part, demand price falls because I am less prepared or I'm, in a way the, the, the price I'm expecting, my expected yield is declining because I'm adjusting by borrower's risk. Okay, so he says then investment projects will go on as long as the demand price is over the supply price, which fundamentally depend on the leverage in the, econo in the economy and on the subjective or conventional uh, uh, um, assessment of an appropriate level of leverage, particularly on behalf of the borrower, but also to a certain extent on, the, on behalf of the lender. Yeah, and how much margin of safety is, is being accepted by both the lender and the borrower. Okay, And that then feeds directly and very neatly into his famous financial instability hypothesis. Sorry, last, last raising of hands. Who has come across the financial instability hypothesis before? Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought it's generally, it's, it's interesting. It's a more, you know, it's a more conventional, um, oh, not more conventional, but it's a, it's a very widely, widely um, taught and, and, and research topic. So basically, sort of for those of you know, for those of you who haven't come across it yet, but so basically, Minsky's financial instability hypothesis is, in a nutshell, the hypothesis or the 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 argument that financial capitalism or capitalist system inherently and endogenously um, move towards financial instability because the leverage increases. As the economy, or as the kind of in, as as the business cycle proceeds, yeah, and so he says the subjective expectations about how much borrowers risk and lenders risk, um, borrowers and lenders are prepared to take, changes over the course of the business cycle. So we start the business cycle. There's a general optimism in the economy. Banks are more prepared to lend. Firms are more prepared to invest and are more prepared to take on debt. Yeah? They invest, they make profits, 
The initial profits, in a way, confirm the positive expectations of a boom. We're entering a boom phase. We're entering even more optimism. He names, he names it euphoria. And, you know, enterprises take on more and more debt. Banks, that, banks are prepared to give that up. Because we're in the boom phase, the leverage increases, and the economy slowly moves to a financially fragile state. So stability breeds instability. We're all positive about the economy. It's all stable. We're prepared to take on that. We're prepared to take on leverage. And we slowly come to a state where the economy moves from a hedged uh, system, so a system where most economic agents would be able to meet their debt or their liability obligations, both the interest rate payments and the amortizations any time, we increasingly move to a state where we have more speculative units, where the expected income of, let's call it the capitalist firms, let's assume those are the ones who have been taking on debt, um, will be able to still meet the interest rates, but not their principal anymore. Two, in the final phase of the boom, a state where we have a preponderance of Ponzi units, where the expected financial income or the actual financial income of the firms with high leverage and debt levels might not, be a, might not even be sufficient anymore to meet either the interest rates payment or the principal a payment of the outstanding debt. So we get to a situation as a result of the boom or in the boom that the economy becomes very financially fragile where any shock exogenously or endogenous can basically tip the, return, tip the system into financial instability. And that can be an exogenous shock, um, but for Minsky it can, it can also be an endogenous shock. And I think one example, for example, could be that because of an overheating economy, because of an increasing you know, awareness that the system is becoming unstable, the central bank raises the interest rates. And it could be that a, a small increase in the financing cost, an increase in the interest rate, in a way makes, in a way turns Ponzi units unable to meet their financial obligations. And then we're kind of entering the downward spiral and we're entering a process of, again, something Mark talked about this morning, debt deflation or the prince in a way the, the paradox of debt where, you know, I'm selling debt and I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I'm, I need to sell my assets in order to meet my debt. But the more I'm selling, the more asset prices are declining and the less I'm able to meet my debt, my, my debt obligations. So we're kind of entering a full-fledged debt, debt deflation, according to Fisher, and we're in a downward spiral. And then for Minsky, in a way, the only thing that can stop that is what he calls big government and a big bank. So it needs both the central bank to intervene in order to hold financial fragility and a big government to intervene to hold, uh, to in a way bail out, bail out the, um, support the firms, but also bail out the banks. Yeah. And then we kind of clear out the system, we get rid of the Ponzi units, and then the whole thing starts again. Yeah. So what it shows you is really, and you know, I think, and I think Minsky is probably the most famous one when it comes to this, is really capital systems are inherently unstable, and there's an endogenous drive to financial instability, and it's the stability which breeds this instability. Yeah, I've already talked about the financial, um, the policy implications. Yeah, and, and talking about application, I mean, Minsky, and again, you know, Mark talked about this morning, Minsky has been applied in a lot of things. So Minsky's initial theory was about firms in a closed, in a closed advanced economy. And people we have taken, you know, has been applied to all kinds of different applications, household banks, open economy, emerging markets, been institutional qualitative analysis like mine or more quantitative ones. Um, and there's a nice over, overview paper by Maria Nicolaidi and Engelbert Stockhammer. Um, yeah, and has been applied to all ways. I wanted to go into an example of, of my own work of how we applied it to emerging markets and external vulnerability, but I'm going to leave that. Um, and I'm, I'm very, we can either talk about it in a break with anybody who's interested or, or in a question and answer session, but I wanted to leave a bit more time. I don't want, didn't want to run over too much, but I can come back to that. We have a bit more time. Fine. With this word, thank you very much. Um, yeah. And um, any questions?
I will, I will take your questions as well. I, I, will, I will come back to your question. Yeah. Slide six. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Julian Ferrin from Freie Universität Berlin. Um, most interesting your presentation. Thank you very much for that. I just had a, a question on that. It, it got me thinking. And um, for example, um, the role of the so called uh, shadow banking sector became a really booming topic, especially after the, the, the most recent financial crisis in the last decade. It became like really present even in the, in the, in the mainstream media and stuff. And um, of course, um, Minsky assumes all these financial actors to be banks. And we have, of course, in the shadow banking system, um, institutions which work as banks but are not regulated as banks either. Is this something that literature has since then perhaps uh, covered? I'm not aware of this. And if so, how? Or is this just equalized to those institutions being banks? Because, of course, they don't follow the same rules and they don't also have the same incentive. So um, how about that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I can respond to those two or I can take some more. Let me respond. Can I take the microphone? I feel so locked behind my... Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I, I take your questions and then, and then I take yours. Yeah? So in terms of the determinants of the, of, the, of the currency hierarchy, in a way, this is one of the most fundamental... In a way, it's one of the biggest gaps we have in that literature because I think we're very good in theorizing, you know, what are the potential implications, etc., etc. But then really pinning down on what determines it, I think there's much less work done. So if anybody wants to do some work on that. But I think there are kind of some, I think people probably have some implicit understandings without having necessarily written about this explicitly. So I think people like, and I didn't want to go to so much into detail, but I think people like Barbara Fritz and Daniela Pratis and kind of um, German monetary Keynes and sort of Brazilian post Keynes, and I think, uh, there's a very strong sense that it's ultimately it's, it's your current account. So I think there's, in a way, there's kind of a sense coming. I think a lot of these authors come from a, a Latin American structuralism and a balance of payments constraint literature where really the inability to kind of run autonomously determined current account surpluses is one of the fundamental determinants of this currency hierarchy. Which, you know, and of course, then has to do with like primary commodity exports, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, high import dependence and all these things. But it's kind of like the structure current account balance of payments constraint, which really lies at the basis of that, I think. And I agree with that. Um, and I think on the other hand, with people like Bruno Bonizzi and myself and Raquel Ramos, who also try to complement that with a more, more Minskian view, where we think, so I think that, I think that even if, these economies could run current account surpluses. I think as long as the global financial system is structured in the way it is, in the sense that a lot of financial activities are actually centered in core financial centers and a lot of financial actors fund themselves, i.e. their liabilities are denominated and, and located in those financial centers, there will be still some sense of hierarchy because as soon as there is an increase in liquidity preference, as soon as as soon as there is an increase of uncertainty, people always, you know, in a way, people need to meet these liabilities, need to generate the funding currency, which means they need to sell emerging market or developing country assets, demand dollar and pay their liabilities. So I think it's a combination. I think it's about, you know, in a way, overcoming the structural balance of payments constraint, but it's also about, and, you know, it's of course a much bigger question, it's also, in, in a way, it's it's also thinking about how unevenly distributed and structured the global monetary and financial system is um, and how that shapes it. Do you have a follow-up question? Yeah. Um, let me answer that and then I'll give you, yeah. And then in terms of the shadow banking system, so I think, and if there are any Minskian specialists in the room, please do correct me. I'm always aware that there might be some like really famous post Keynesian hidden somewhere there who kind of like sits there and is like, oh, <laughs> so please, if you're one of them, speak up now. <laughs> but my sense is that, so Minsky itself, so I think Minsky's concern was with the capitalist firm. So it was about, you know, the debt levels in the capitalist firm uh, and the instabilities and fragilities created in them, yeah? And if we look at the firm, in a sense, it doesn't matter so much where the financing comes from, whether it comes from a bank or whether it comes from a kind of a, 
um, a non-bank financial institution, yeah, shadow banking. In terms of the kind of recent extensions to the Minsk and work, particularly from a critical macrofinance per view and this kind of balance sheet view of the world, the Wall Street view, I think there's quite a lot of work that has been going on looking at the balance sheet structure of the shadow banking system, particularly how it interlocks with the balance sheets of the normal banking system, how that creates, creates a hierarchy of monies, although I disagree, but anyway, of, uh, it creates a hierarchy of monies, of liabilities, of interlocking liabilities how that then means how the different access to different types of monies creates fragilities. Um, I can go into that. But so I think there is, there is, quite, a, uh, there is quite a bit of work on applying um, Minskian um, ideas or, or this balance sheet's view of the world to the shadow banking system. But the original view, I think, is, is really about the firm. And there, I personally think it wouldn't matter that much where the, where the leverage comes from. So my follow-up question was that um, one uh, is there, what, what do the post Keynesians have to say about like a commodity backstop determining the uh, hierarchy of currencies? Like for instance, David Harvey argues that ultimately it's the um, you know who has control on say gold or it could be oil, uh, which would determine uh, the hierarchy. Uh, so, so, I mean, what, uh, what, what does the post uh what is the view on that? And also, like, your emphasis on the current, uh, the inability to run current account surpluses. Uh, so, I mean, there's also, like, uh, like some literature which I came across that uh, about um, is current account now uh, in this present milieu of... A financialization, is it an adequate indicator of the external vulnerabilities of economies in the presence of rising gross flows? Um, so, so, so in that, because in that context, um, uh, is it adequate to say that the current, the inability to run current account surpluses would determine the uh, hierarchy? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, Alejandro Gonzalez from uh, Washu. So great, great presentation. So I think uh, some post Keynesian economists have found it very, some of them have found it difficult to kind of find empirical support for the financial instability hypothesis. So for me, what comes to mind, I think, you know, Marx and Mario Segarichas, there's a famous paper they wrote in the, th in the 2000s, right? Um, trying to found, you know, this pro cyclical leverage that's so central to, to Minsky's work and they didn't really find anything. So, you know, I'm, I'm just curious, what's your assessment, kind of your quantitative assessment of, of where we at in terms of how much empirical support the, you know, the perhaps not the broader, you know, financial instability hypothesis, but specifically, you know, pro-cyclical leverage as a central mechanism for, for business cycles. Um, thank you. Don't let it out anymore. <laughs> um, so, commodity price stabilization programs. Yes, of course they would help. So, if we're assuming that one of the constraints is a balance of payments constraint and, you know, the inability to... And we know that one of the problems is commodity dependence and declining terms of trades, etc., etc. So, that would help. But I don't think it's sufficient because I think, you know, we know that one of, you know, Instability is one of the problems of commodity prices, but the other problem is also value. You know, how much value does the you know does the production of certain products uh, create? And we know, you know, if you're in high value added manufacturing production, that in a way creates more value and is you know a higher productivity sectors than commodity production. Yeah. So if we so I think we need commodity price stabilization problem. But we also need domestic industrialization strategy strategies and support to kind of you know in a way diversify and ideally move up to higher value added production in, um, in developing economies rather than just stabilizing commodity prices. I don't, think, I don't think that will be sufficient. Now, in terms of your gross flows, I totally agree. And I think this is probably where you know, the work with Bruno and myself comes in that you know, we, we observe that even if the countries are running current account surpluses, which you know, commodity exporters very often do, or even, you know, I don't want to kind of just say, I, I, 
I don't want to just say it's, co it's just commodity exporters have got the problem because Southeast Asia has got the same problem. You know, they're kind of manufacturing workers at the moment, but they still, I would still argue, at least countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, or Thailand, or Philippines are still lower down the currency hierarchy. So it's also low value added manufacturing experts which have the problems. And so, but going back to your question, so I think, you know, yes, we see that even if you run a current account surplus, you're still vulnerable to this external vulnerability, financial fragility, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is where in our work, in our Minskin work, we kind of emphasize, look, you need to see how these global balance sheets are structured. And if you see them, you know, if you see basically global financial relations dominated by actors from the, from the global core who fund themselves in the global core, then of course you will have, as soon as the shit hits the fan, they will have liability calls, they will have to meet their liabilities, they will sell their assets, probably in the most liquid markets first, and will meet these liabilities, and you have large uh, depreciations or, or, or asset declines in, in, in developing and emerging economies. So yes, I think these cross flows matter, but I think to just put it on these cross flows is also not sufficient. You know, I think these, you know, over time, I think if you had a more diversified domestic economy and if you were able to kind of, you know, control your, your um, control the current account, you can't control your current account. But if you can, you know, if you, if you can, you know, gen in a way, and not the, you know, not have the, the 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 commodity dependence. I think that in a way would also create some preconditions to to change these more these more global structures. I think the other thing I want to say is that, and I think that very often, um, I think this is a bit of a discussion which goes into MMT as well. I think the problem is because one one thing that MMT often very says in this situation is, well, all you need to do is to you just have a. You, you just have a domestic public bank, which basically finances you, and then you, you know, basically you can domestically generate all the money you need, which is fine, but it's not fine if you're an input-dependent economy. So if you actually have to finance a lot of your domestic production, and just getting you know, a domestic currency will not be sufficient because you will have to exchange it into foreign currency in order to finance your imports. And if you have a currency which is lower down the hierarchy, this is much harder because your liquidity uh, is impaired. So it's much harder to actually exchange your currency on foreign currency markets to generate the foreign, you know, to get that foreign exchange if you wanted it. Um, yeah, so I think I wanted to just highlight that as well. Never mind, if you live in a country in Argentina, they will change it immediately into, into dollars anyway. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. Sorry, yes, yes, yeah. you know why? Because you're quite, because I don't have an answer. I do what Mark says. I'm not, I'm not on top of the of the current empirical literature on testing the the the, um, the leverage the leverage um, Minsky's leverage things, so I, I can't give you a definite answer. What I do know is that so I know, for example, people like Engelberg and Carsten Köhler are doing work on on business cycles, and I do show that this is related to. Um, well, a, a, that the business cycle exists, there are cyclical dynamics, and if I'm not all wrong, Carsten also shows how this is related to the leverage dynamics of firms. So, there might be some good papers to look at, some recent papers, but I don't have the current empirical results on my top of my head, sorry. Hello, thank you for your talk. I'm Nicholas Collard from Javier. Um, I'm, if fundamental uncertainty is ontological, then in a certain sense finance is also ontological as there needs to be a technology for sharing risk. Um, I'm wondering if we're thinking about a more global, globally equitable risk sharing, what are the limits on the specifically capitalist market-based financial system? Like what are the limits for regulation there? Um, and I also am asking this in the context of Perry Merling's new book where I think he's arguing that the dollar is reasserting itself as the global reserve currency against those who think that we're going to see a diversification with commodities and other currencies. And so I'm wondering what the limits are in your view of an equitable regulation of finance from an international perspective. Hi, Nina. Um, thanks for an excellent um, presentation. 
I really enjoyed it. And yeah, well, um, I think most people in the audience, I suppose, would agree with kind of Minskin view of the inherent instability of the system. My question is related to that. Uh, there are in fact two interrelated questions. One, to what extent you personally believe that we are headed towards another major financial crisis? That's question number one. And number two um, is about the role of central banks in connection to that. So to what extent do you believe that central banks can continue to intervene to stabilize financial markets? In other words, are there any limits beyond which even the most powerful central banks like the Fed or others, the ECB, will not be able to stabilize the system and the system collapses? Thank you. Okay, I'll take those because they're really difficult questions. Um, so I think to your first one, um, I, think I, I think I agree with, with, with Perry. So I think I'm looking at this from a post-Keynesian perspective and looking at this from a post-Keynes liquidity preference theory perspective where we have discussed that in the face of fundamental uncertainty, we need, in a way, one safe asset which protects us against this uncertainty. Um, and this safe asset is money, um, which on the global level is the dollar. Then I agree with Gary that actually, as we kind of move to more uncertainty and also a more market-based system, I think actually the dollar as currently the global you know, the global safe asset will reassert itself. And it is. If you look at all the empirical indicators, the dollar is as strong as it, as it has never been. Um, you know, there might be alternative assets which kind of temporarily emerge. I don't know, a stable coin or whatever, where people think it's an alternative asset. But I think if really push comes to shove, it's the dollar. Partly, I mean, in a network effects, but partly because it has the, lend it has the Fed sitting behind itself and the Fed being prepared to do whatever it can to stabilize the role and provide global liquidity and they've done that times and times again and you know the COVID shock has just shown again how proactive the Fed is in in maintaining that role of the dollar and in securing that dominant role of the dollar so as long as, long as the Fed is doing that um, I think it will be the case having said that at the same time I think and I would love to understand I would love to have more time to research into this or people who know about this. I think the Chinese are working on something. You know, I think the Chinese are working on alternate, particularly when it comes to infrastructures. You know, I think they are working on the monetary and financial infrastructures in a way to create the preconditions should they ever arise in order to have a more bi-metallic um, monetary system. But I think we're a long way off from that. Um, but, they're, you know, they're working on that. In terms of uh, what, you know, is, is there so much, what, is there only so much that central bank can do? So I think I've got three answers to this. And again, correct me. I think my first one is in terms of really calming down financial instability at the moment, as long as that financial instability is happening in your domestic currency, in a way, a central bank, and I agree with MMT there, they're pretty powerful because they can issue as much as they want from that currency and they can intervene. So, I mean, it's just recently, you know, whether it's a lender of last resort, a market maker of last resort, however you call it, I think there the central bank has immense firepower and they can do a lot. And, you know, the, the, the UAE interventions just recently have shown they've been extremely successful. What, of course, the central banks cannot do, and that's what quantitative easing has shown, is they cannot get banks to lend. So in a way, what they cannot do is, you know, if you are in a kind of recessionary way, or if the if the economy conditions don't induce banks to lend, they can give them, you know, the, the the monetary conditions can be as easy as they want to. And again, you know, I think endogenous monetary theory has a lot to say here. You know, if nobody wants to borrow, then you know, the banks can, yeah, you know, nothing. So I think there, the central banks are actually more limited. And of course, the big issue the central banks have to face now is 
you know, dealing, dealing, dealing with stagflation, you know, dealing with inflation in a period where actually growth is quite lackluster, at least in, the, in you know, what we're seeing in the UK. And that, again, you know, central banks are, in a way, powerless. And in a way, it, it creates this conundrum because, no, it's not a conundrum, but, you know, central banks, you know, we, we were living in a, in, in a time of cost push, in, push inflation, and, you know, Bella Weber, I'm sure it's much better to talk about this. So all the central banks are, can, can do is to raise interest rates, um, which cost push inflation is not going to do much. All it does is kind of create more recessionary, you know, influences on the economy. In the UK, at the same time, you have a government, like, wanting to spend full throttle because they won't win the next elections. Anyway, I'm, I'm going off tangent, but I think in a way, you know, calming down financial market, yes. Getting banks to lend, no. Dealing with the financial, the, 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 the cost push inflation which we are facing at the moment, difficult. Or, and, or at a very high cost. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, Richard Senner from the Swiss National Bank. I don't One see you. <coughs> Where are you? Oh, back there. Okay, yeah. Uh, one question regarding uh, today's situation, today's evolution of asset prices globally over the last years or even decades, how they decouple from, real, from the real economy, from GDP. Uh, how would you explain these, the evolution of these asset prices? Because conventional theory looks at discounted future cash flow models, um, but then also Minsky and Keynes, I don't see how they are not directly applicable with all the shadow money and and central bank interventions and and mortgage group booms around the world. So how would you um, explain the evolution of, of asset prices, equities, real estate, uh, globally? So from a post-Keynesian perspective, I would point you to chapter 12. From a political economist perspective, I would say we have a major problem with global inequality. And I would say there's, you know, whilst a lot of people are getting poorer, there's also a lot of, quite a, no, not a lot, a few, small people, a small number of people uh, getting richer and richer, which can probably feed asset price dynamics a long time, whilst the real economy is really struggling. So I think probably global inequality has a lot to answer for. Uh, yes. One, two, one, two. Okay. Um, so I taught financial stability over the last year, and one sort of conjecture I came to, and I know you can sort of find it in Minsky and Kinderberger, but it's the role of innovation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So physical innovation, financial innovation. Right, and so my question is, do you believe it would be possible to experience the same level of uh, financial instability, like driven through balance sheet processes, um, in like almost the absence of any form of innovation? Sorry, so the, so the second, the last. Do you believe it would yeah. be possible to experience financial instability without practically any form of innovation? The honest answer is, I don't know. I can only speculate, but my hunch is no. Because I think regulators are kind of coming, you know, regulators are picking up with what's happening. So I think regulators have picked up. And, you know, the balance sheets of banks have shrunk tremendously. I mean, banks are not the big players anymore. We know it's the asset managers now. Um, so, and, you know, in a way, you know, regulation is probably taking care of some of the most toxic uh, financial instruments, which were at the core of the... Um, at the bottom of the global financial crisis. So I think to really create another systemic global, you know, systemic financial instability like we have seen in the global financial crisis, this is probably not possible with like a major sense of financial innovation. But then, you know, just talking about this, so I think the, the problem is, so, so my answer is no, I think we need financial innovation, but then just to kind of point, it's also really hard to tell 
whether certain financial innovations will actually create the risk. So, for example, if we look at what happened with pension funds in the UK, uh, liability-driven investment. So, basically, to cut a very long story short, pension funds, in order to kind of, in a way, hedge their liabilities because interest rates have been have been have been so low, and they have the pension funds liabilities have been holding treasury bonds, and they've been hedging. You know, they've they've, they've engaged in hedging operations and in, in repo operations in order to kind of, in a way, balance. You know, hedge their hedge their liabilities, which on paper, I mean, everybody has known that this is what they are doing, and nobody has said it has actually say, looked relatively secure and looked as if balance funds are basically securing their future pensions. Now, what nobody expected is that in the UK, the interest rate, the interest rate would go from whatever to whatever, but to, you know, would change with very fast, very quickly, which would rip apart all the hedges um, from the pension funds and trigger margin calls. So. I don't know whether that directly answers your questions. You know, so was that a financial innovation? It probably was, but everybody knew about it, but nobody really saw. The, few people did, but saw the risks, and and only when this kind of like event happened, uh, we could see what implications it could have. Yeah. So it's a roundabout question, but to be very to be very short on your question, I think we probably to have like such a global systemic crisis, like we had a global financial crisis, there probably need to be some innovations which regulators aren't aware of yet. I think we can leave it there, no? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, sorry, that was a, no, that was a question. That was a question here. Sorry. Hi, I'm Katrin from Pittsburgh, and I was just wondering whether there was enough time for your last slide on your own research, but yeah. Oh, my own I can research. also ask you in the coffee break, maybe, yeah. Yeah, well, I think I've indulged myself enough now, but I'm very happy to chat in the, in, in the coffee break about my own research. Always thank happy you. to do that. Well, thank you so much, everybody. It was, it was a pleasure. And I hope to see you all in the course of the conference. And it's brilliant to see such a full room and that our community is thriving and surviving, which is amazing. Right. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>